An architect is trained in many, many things, more than most professionals. I mean, I compare them to other professionals because I work with all professionals. But I know um, and I study architecture and respect how much they know. It's unbelievable, right? But they don't know marketing. They are not marketers. They're not graphic designers. They do know they do know creative visual design, but they're not graphic designers. And you know, they, they need to know what they know and what they don't know. Episode 122. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Welcome to the show, Sandra Becker. She is the president of Becker Management. She has helped take leading entrepreneurs to a new level in the global marketplace with the introduction of business and marketing strategies, as well as the enhancement of company structure and process. So Sandra has degrees in physiology from McGill University and a second Bachelor of Science in Architecture from McGill University. And she's joining us today from Toronto, Canada. Sandra. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Sandra, talk to us a little bit about, we're going to jump into marketing here. And we first touch bases when we met in person, when I flew to Toronto with Eric and we talked about, we gave our presentation on marketing for architects, you were giving a similar presentation uh, focused on business development, talking about turning strangers into clients. And that's yes, where we first met. Okay. So tell me, tell us a little bit about what you presented to the architects up there at the OAA about turning strangers into clients. How do we turn strangers into clients? What's the process? Uh, well, for that session, what I did is I put together kind of a roadmap that gives architects and other professionals a path to follow for their social media marketing. And what I've experienced in my business is that a lot of people, they, they get really busy with social media, but busy isn't profitable, right? You know, and uh, the other thing that isn't profitable is a whole bunch of likes and follows, right? You know this, you know, you're in the business. <laughs> and so, uh, my focus is to get people to stop thinking about social media in terms of, in terms of likes and follows and start thinking about it in terms of return for their business. Okay. So the path basically starts with everything that you would normally do for business planning. Um, think about who's my target market. Very, very basic thing. But honestly, if you don't go deep with that, that one question, it changes your whole social media marketing program. Um, so Can you for give example, an example, yeah, give me an example yeah. <laughs> of what it means to go deep with that, Sandra. Right. Okay. So for somebody who needs to get really specific, I would tell that client, give me 10 names, 10 names of the bullseye market. Who do you want to be working with in the next year, two years, three years, actual names and Let's put a pattern together based on those names. Okay. So um, what sector are they in? Um, who's the person in those companies that you need to be making contact with? Um, why did you choose those companies? What, what is it about them that reflects what you've been successful at in the past? Another way to do this exercise is go backwards. Okay. So look at your portfolio. Um, not your literal portfolio, but your portfolio of work over the history of your practice and apply the 80-20 rule. 80-20 rule always works, right? So where did 20% of your profit come from? Or look at it a different way. Where did 20% of your happiness come from? <laughs> you know, which which clients, which projects um, made, you the, made you the most money or made you happiest? And try and figure out what is the pattern among those projects? What did, what 
what is consistent? Um, is it the type of client? Is it the type of project? Is it the piece of the process that I worked on? You know, people think about point of difference and target marketing in very narrow terms, but actually can be very creative about how you think about it. And so anyway, that, that's just an example of how you get started with the path. Um, asking yourself business planning questions like who is my target market and going very deep with it. Then applying all those answers to your social marketing. Okay, so now we have a list of these people. Okay, so go on LinkedIn. Are they there? You know, are they on Facebook? Where are these people? And what are they doing there? So it's one thing to find them. Another thing is to understand their behavior. Okay, maybe they're on LinkedIn and they're never there. <laughs> they don't do anything. They have a profile. You can look at recent activity. You know, you can, you can pull up, okay, what have they done in the past two weeks? Okay. It's summer months. Try it again in a few weeks. If they haven't been doing anything for two weeks, they don't use it. So you can still read, you can still use it to find them. But a very important part of the path that I created is go offline. Don't use social marketing, social media marketing as a crutch. You use it sort of in a flowing way, you know, go on and offline as you need to. It's the same thing you would do in traditional marketing if you went to an event. You know, you go to an event, you collect a bunch of cards, call, you pick up the phone, you know, do the old fashioned thing, press the flesh, that works. <laughs> so how do you, when you say take it offline, give me an example of how that would work uh, in a hypothetical process here. Say we have our list of X number of contacts that fit our client profile. We've identified that some of them are active on Twitter, some of them are active on LinkedIn, some aren't active on LinkedIn. Where do we take it from there? Okay, so you know the you know the, um, the rule of thumb that you need about seven touches to make progress with a client? At least seven touches, right, to make a sale? The seven touches can be anything, right? It can be, oh, okay, I bumped into them in an elevator. Oh, I sent an email, um, you know, and then we had a meeting. That's three touches, right? So to to come up with your touches, okay, so I found the guy on LinkedIn. So I connected with him on LinkedIn. But I'm aware because I, you know, I checked a few times to see his recent activity. He doesn't really use it. So I don't have um, – any other contact with this person other than LinkedIn, but that's the beginning. So I read his bio on LinkedIn. At least I have some information, some insight to what does he do? I might have information about hobbies or school. Where did he come from? It's really an unbelievable resource. You know, five years ago, we didn't have this kind of information and making um, progress with your relationships uh, depends on having common common interests or some kind of commonality, pick up something that you can create a conversation with, send an email following up. Okay, great to connect with you on LinkedIn. Hey, I noticed we grew up in the same neighborhood or we went to the same school. Um, you know, uh, send him an article, tell him, oh, you know, I, I remember we were chatting about this thing. I just came across this article that reminded me of what the question you asked. Here it is. Um, next time you touch base with him, hey, would you like to grab a coffee? I happen to be in your in the neighborhood of your office. So this is how you know you leverage what you have online and then use offline for what offline is better at. <laughs> if he's not there on LinkedIn, he's not going to see all your posts. So get him offline. And how do you recommend people get them offline? Are we talking about a, a cold a cold call? You know, some people feel they feel hesitant about that. That's why they like to use these other media tools as crutches almost. Well, I think that those other tools can help break the ice, you know, so if it, even if there's a presence on one site, I'm talking about LinkedIn, because it is probably the, the most likely place to find a business contact and um, their recept receptivity for business contact is higher on that site. Uh, so it's a good place to start. But Twitter, Google, you know, um, Google Plus might also be good places. And so if 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 you are finding somebody is there but they're not active, active on that site, connecting with them there is good, but then getting, you know, um, the example that I just described, okay, connecting with somebody and then following up with an email and asking them to go out for a coffee after you've already been helpful a few times. So they start to know you, they start to trust you, they start to understand what is your place in their world. Uh, not to come out with that very quickly because, then, you know, they don't 
understand, um, first of all, what's the value to them or who are you? But, you know, people develop relationships even before they've met you. So if, if, if you already have, so we have the seven touches we're counting towards, we're counting down to seven touches at least, right? Let's say we've done one LinkedIn. Okay. We bumped, in, bumped into the guy in the elevator. We've done LinkedIn connection. That's two. We sent him an email with an article. That's three. We've sent him something else uh, or, or, or at this point, maybe we've picked up the phone, said, Hey, I'm going to be in your neighborhood. That's four, five. You meet with him. Okay. So, it, so you're doing the online off- offline. And what would you say to people that say, ah, you know, that just feels really spammy. It just feels salesy to be chasing people like that. Well, if you're doing it in a way that's self-serving, it is spammy and salesy. I would suggest don't do that. <laughs> what, what's, what does that mean, self-serving? And what's the alternative? Okay. So if you put yourself in the shoes of your, your prospective clients or a referrer, whoever it is that you're trying to contact, And try to think about, well, what does this person need? What do they want? What is it that I can give them to make their job easier? Maybe I know somebody that they need to make contact with. You know what? I've I've done this for some clients. Put them in touch with um, uh, professional bodies. And they got very high-profile speaking gigs. Or with um, uh, other clients of mine. And they, they got a client. Is there someone I can put them in touch with? Is there information they're seeking? Um, just put yourself in their mindset and try and understand what it is that they need or they're looking for and be useful. If you're being useful, you're not being spammy, but be useful in a way that is very customized to what that particular person needs. And you can only do that if you really understand them. And that's why I go back to the path. So if you had those 10 people, those 10 clients on your list and said, okay, these are this is my target market. I'm getting really specific you can study, study the hell out of them, really understand what do these people need. That's the difference between taking the broad approach and saying, okay, you know what? I'm going after residential and commercial. Okay, so is everyone else, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So. <laughs> so give me an example. So we hear a lot about new media. Right, new media. There's there's Twitter. There's social media. You know, you've given us a, lo- a couple of examples of kind of things that you're seeing that's working. W- could you give us some more examples? What do you see working in this new media space uh, with these new media tools? Well, you know what i I just went to um I just went to a lecture at uh, Google downtown here in Toronto. Actually, it was for for law firm marketing, and. When they opened up the session, they said, if there's two things that you're going to remember from this session, is this, mobile and video. I'm like, okay, I remember that now. Mobile, video, now I'm telling you, okay? <laughs> so those are the two things that are really hot. And uh, what they told us is that searches on YouTube are now trending higher than on Google. Impressive. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're not already doing video here, if you're not already doing video, do video that's that's an important tech takeaway people are watching it um architects are in such a unique uh space to leverage video like no other professional right but that doesn't mean just do video for the sake of doing video and remember that not only an architect is trained in many many things more than most professionals i mean i compare them to other professionals because i work with all professionals But I know, um, and I studied architecture and respect how much they know. It's unbelievable, right? But they don't know marketing. They are not marketers. They're not graphic designers. They do know, they do know creative visual design, but they're not graphic designers. And, you know, they, they need to know what they know and what they don't know. That's a good lesson for all of us. Know what you know, know what you don't know. Sandra, I'd like to compare and contrast. You work with other industries. You mentioned law firm marketing. Can you just compare? Let's talk for a minute about some of the differences between the challenges attorneys face and the challenges architects face and some of the similarities because I think we could probably pull out some good lessons from that. Sorry, you want me to compare the challenges that architects are facing with 
with what attorneys face in your law firm marketing. So oh, let's okay. talk about those two and just what's similar about them, what's different about them. Let's talk about that for a bit. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, okay. I, I, you know, what we were just talking about in terms of understanding what your limitations are, that's a really good point to start this conversation. Okay, so for architects, they, because they're so comfortable with the visual, it's very easy to have, you know, a conversation about creative direction. Okay, so what should your website look like? What should your logo look like? But the challenge inherent in that skill is that they think they know more than they know. And so they, they might take on a role that is beyond their own capability, not understanding um, the subliminal messaging and graphic design that's all about marketing, which is completely different from the messaging in, a, in, in the visual of an architectural space. Okay, so what appears to be a strength actually carries with it a challenge. Lawyers have exactly the same situation when it comes to the written word right? Because they write, that's what they do. And so they, you know, they get very controlling, sorry, lawyers, but, (laughs) 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 and I know some of them are going to watch me on this. (laughs) Um, You know, um, they get, they get controlling when it comes to text in their marketing because they write for a living and they think they know how to write and they do, they know how to write, but what they don't understand is the difference between legal text and marketing text and why, um, what makes marketing text work. Okay. So, so there again, the strength carries with it a real limitation, um, not understanding the subliminal messaging, not understanding how the audience responds to emotional messages rather than just rational, um, you know, facts. That's, that's not how, that's not what drives marketing. Um, other limitations. So lawyers are, I, I would say they are ahead of all professions in terms of adopting social media marketing, in terms of particularly blogging. And that again goes to them knowing how to write. They, they, they're good with expressing their ideas. Um, architects, I would say, are very limited in terms of embracing these tools. So as a result, they're not benefiting. Right. So if you if you think about it, think, compare to the, the situation we're at right now with 15 years ago. It's almost like we were given the tools to have free television advertising. What does it cost to get into TV? I mean, you're in the States. You know, think about it. Minimum, minimum a million dollars. That and that's that's like you know barely scratching the surface. Yep. Now, you can do a fantastic video campaign, and YouTube will distribute distribute it for you for free. Right? You can do it any length you want. You can turn it into a teaser. You can you can just keep leveraging it, and it's there for free. And what are architects doing with all of these tools? Not very much. So I would say that that's a challenge. Lawyers are doing a lot more with it. They're, they're not as, they're not as shy about it. Okay. Any, any other insights just in, in terms of uh, the different marketing challenges that each of them have or the way that they develop business insights that we can pull out there, Sandra? Mm, Yeah. And you mean comparing them to lawyers? Yeah. Comparing them to lawyers? Uh, yeah, actually, they're very different in, in that way. So lawyers, because of the nature of their job, are more business oriented. They understand and are very comfortable with just normal business processes, um, negotiation, planning, um, partnering with other people, you know, uh, project management. Uh, actually, project man- management is totally unfair. Architects are very, very comfortable with that. Uh, so, so these aspects of putting together a marketing campaign, working with other people, delegating, all of that is very comfortable for a lawyer. Um, for an architect, like, it, I would say this is getting out of their comfort zone. And mm, there's some resistance. Whenever you get out of your comfort zone, there's some resistance. But uh, there's benefit because 
If if you stay within the things that, that you're already good at, you you reach sort of your ceiling in terms of growing. So are there are there any differences in the way that attorneys and architects attract clients in terms of identifying uh, their target clients? Or, you know, I think that I guess there would be two types of lawyers or attorneys. There'd be business to consumer and business to business. There would be, uh, you know, attorneys that focus on large commercial clients. And then there's attorneys probably that do stuff like accident law where they're they don't really know who their target client is, right? You can't just identify unless you chase that proverbial ambulance. You don't really know who's who's out there wanting the services of a lawyer. So I think that's similar to the challenge that architects have. And, you know, residential architects have a similar challenge where they don't really know who's planning a residential remodel. They don't know who's planning a new house. And so it's hard for them to target that person by by hunting them down. Whereas commercial architects have the advantage of they can look at the corporations, they can look at the banks, they know this is a potential client. Yeah, that's true. They they do. So you're asking me if there's a there's a similarity or difference between how they pursue that client? Correct, correct. Okay, well the parallels you just drew are absolutely true. Um, both lawyers and architects have both the business to business and business to consumer stream. And even within those streams, there are lots of choices about how you pursue it um, because you can have a marketing campaign that's strictly focused on pursuing the referrer in no matter what your business is about, the B2B or the B2C, sorry, business to business or business to consumer. And if, if what you do is you focus strictly on the referrer, you've simplified your marketing plan. You can do that in architecture too. You know, your whole campaign, seriously, you can ignore the consumer. <laughs> Just <laughs> don't alienate them. <laughs> but focus all your efforts, all your money on going after that referrer. That, that's a great strategy. Can you expound on what that would look like for an architecture firm? Um. Yeah, okay. So, for example, let's say, and you're saying, okay, with the resident uh with the consumer, it's a little bit harder to, to pin them down. So who would, and, and again, you can look at your 80-20 rule. So in the history of my practice, who has referred, um, you know, the end consumer to me? Okay, look look back in your in the history. What types of profession are they? Where do, you know, what, what part of the city are they in? And try and come up with some patterns and figure out, okay, so how do I go after these in the future? Where are they in terms of, how I can reach them. Are they using social media marketing? What is their behavior on those sites? How can I find them? How can I go after them? What do they care about? Is there, is there something that I can do that adds value, makes their jobs better or easier to help position myself as a go-to with that audience? Does it mean, do I give them lectures? Do I send them articles? Do I give them opportunity to put themselves on a soapbox, right? So for example, I could have a publication that goes out that has um, a joint venture kind of feel to it. Okay, so what types of professions are we talking about? For example, it could be real estate agents, could be landscape architects, it could be interior designers. And, you know, any of these professionals would come into contact with the same audience, could be lighting designers. You know, the more specific you get, the more you're going to be able to expand your list and be very, very clear about who is it. And let's tell our listeners, paint a picture for them of what would the marketing collateral look like? You know, so I have this list of potential people that could refer me work. How the heck do I get them to refer mm -hmm. me more work? Oh, this is such a great question. You know, when I started my business, uh, it was 10 years ago, and the most common answer I would get from people was, um, oh, you know, I don't need marketing. All my business is word of mouth. <laughs> okay, that's fine. They're not different. <laughs> they can work together, you know, as a partnership. Um, word of mouth is better when you do great marketing. And why is it better when you do great marketing? Because you're leveraging that great network that you've created out of your goodwill, your good reputation, and feeding them with some clarity about what you do and what you want. 
if these people really believe in your practice, okay, they, they love, you know, something about you. They had a good experience with you. You treated a client of theirs well. You made them look good. They liked the house. They live in your house, whatever it is. They have some reason to be a fan. You want to be feeding them absolutely, absolute clarity about how they can help you. Okay. And, you know, what does that mean? That means a brochure that's clear. It means a newsletter that they can send to their network, a website that specifically says, these are the kinds of files we take. These are the kinds of clients we work with. Great. So being very clear about who you're (laughs) looking for and yeah. enabling them to refer that work on to you, letting them know that you're looking for, you know, X kind of client. Yeah, you're turning your referral network into a sales force when, when you arm them with information. And and you, you can't just do it once, right? Like, oh, you know, well, oh, I told them a year ago. Well, so do you think they didn't have things to do in that year? Like, <laughs> Come up with something to stay fresh in their minds and, again, not in a way that's self-serving and salesy. That's not fitting in professional practice. It has to be in a way that always adds value. So what are some things that you're seeing working now? Do you have any anecdotes or stories from recent work with clients, Sandra, that is demonstrating this, uh, this process that we're talking about right now? Well, just as a very, very simple example, couldn't be more simple, Um, you know, with lawyers, uh, clients that want to focus specifically on referrers, the language that they use in their marketing is entirely different from how they would speak to the end user, okay, because their referral network is up on legalese. You, you can get away with technical terminology when you're speaking with, you know, a certain professional that is familiar. They're so used to working with lawyers and they, they're just, and when you do that, you're positioning yourself as an authority with that audience. On the other hand, if you were speaking directly to the consumer, you would have lost them. They'd be like, this guy's a snob. I don't understand how he talks. I know I'm not going to understand him when I meet with him, Right. So that's, that's very strategic. That's a decision. Okay. I'm going after the referrer and this is how how I'm, this is how, this is what they're going to respond to. Yeah. And that goes back to one of your lessons you talked about earlier, which was the copywriting. You mentioned using emotional emotion Mm -hmm. to sell. Could you give us some examples of, you know, people who, uh, you know, for our architect listeners, when they're developing their marketing collateral, when they're thinking about the text on their website, what are some tips to help them make sure that their marketing? Well, I mean, the first tip is go out there and hire an excellent copywriter, <laughs> right? That's the first tip. But <laughs> <laughs> that's the most important one. I'll give that one. Uh, other than that, you know, um, what what should they be looking for in good copywriting? How can they recognize it, and what is it? Okay, well, the first thing is good copywriting is sits on a foundation, like a house sits on a foundation. The beautiful, beautiful house, if it didn't have a foundation, look at it in a year, it's going to be crumbled, right? It just doesn't work. So what's that foundation with copywriting? It's strategy. It's not copy. So understanding, understanding your point of difference in a way that is far deeper than you ever imagined, you know, scratching beyond the surface um, so that you can actually direct the copy. That's the first step. I mean, you, you can't, you can't work with a great marketing professional, great copywriter and get any, anything great out of them without, without doing the planning. You, you could work with somebody who really knows to, how to write and without that foundation, you'll get generic, generic copy from them. Honestly, it's not about the talent at that point. And so, okay, that, sorry, go ahead, Enoch. No, I was just going to say, so you mentioned that it, it involves identifying that point of difference. So what other, what is this foundation? Mm-hmm. What is in the foundation? And so the point of difference has kind of two arms to it. One of them is in practical terms. What is it that you do? What is, what is the service that you do that is different? That doesn't mean area of practice necessarily, a point of difference can be, 
You can be very creative about carving out your point of difference. It could be the style in which I work. It could be the way I get my clients to open up to me to tell me what their aspirations are. I have a way of getting them to really give it, give me, you know, give me their dreams. And so I can build it, build it better because I, I understand it better. That's a difference, right? And it couldn't be, it, maybe it's not a difference in service. So understanding that in terms of practical terms, what's the service? And the other part of it is the personality of it. Think of that like a person, you know, the character or the culture of the firm. Is it warm and soft? Is it uh, accurate and, you know, precise and angular and <laughs> um, business-like? You know, there, there, are, there are many different um, aspects to the character of an architectural firm. That's not just there in the background. It's a very important part of point of difference. You know, architecture is, is consulting. And at the end of the day, consulting is based on fit. So if you put those characteristics forefront in your marketing, it becomes part of connecting with your audience. Great. So you asked, you asked me about emotion in marketing. Yes. So let me tell you a little th- something about emotion in marketing. <laughs> you may know this already, Enoch. <laughs> um, people like to justify their purchasing decisions based on data, right? So if somebody buys something really, let's say they've made a big splurge. Okay. Oh, I just did one yesterday. I'll tell you about it. Okay, I just bought the Vitamix. <laughs> okay. And I can go and explain to my friends, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I, I checked out all the specs and the horsepower was better and, you know, it, and it had better parts. It's going to last better. But you know why I bought it? Because I loved it. I wanted to buy it. <laughs> Nothing to do with the specs. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's how marketing works. Most people will not admit. They, they won't even admit it to themselves. Why did they make a purchasing decision? The purchasing decision is always, always, always about emotion. And if you don't get them on emotion, you don't get them. They might justify it on any other term. That's not why they made the decision. So if you don't connect with them emotionally in your marketing, you lost them. And people might watch this and say, no, I don't get that. You know, I deal with business people and they're very, you know, they're very to the point and they don't, you know, they're, they're not, they don't care about, oh, how, you know, cozy is the house they're, they're running a business. Okay. That's not their emotion. They have a different emotion. What's their emotion? <laughs> their emotion is, oh, I don't want to feel stress. I want to feel, you know, like, like, uh, trust. Okay. That's an emotion too. Just find out what emotion it is that, that you need to tap into. And that's the secret to your marketing. And then how does one go about tapping into that motion through marketing? Well, I'll tell you how they don't go about it. <laughs> they don't go about it by doing a cookie cutter website like everybody else. You know, architects have this, um, well, it's not fair to say it's just architects. A lot of professionals do this. They feel that um, doing what others do is safer when it's not. It's actually riskier, right? So I don't know if you've noticed this, but a lot of architects, and I've even I've even stood up in front of uh, big crowds of people, you know, doing a speaking gig like at OAA and asked people, okay, before I get into my speech here, <laughs> how many of you would, would tell me that you believe architects use predictable Pre- predictable formats for their websites and like every hand shoots up I'm like okay i can start talking about this now <laughs> so <laughs> if you know <laughs> if you all agree and you all know that um architect websites follow a predictable format tell me what is it and they actually told me what is it so there's a, the, the big beauty shot from the from the portfolio Right. The standard navigation bar that says, you know, services and and portfolio and and pretty much everything about it is consistent from from site to site. So so that's an example of how you don't go about it. You're not eliciting anything from me. What you're doing is, okay, you're showing off some some beauty shots, which is okay. That's fine. I'm not saying not to do that, but that's not how to get at the emotion. In fact, there are some. There are some great marketing examples out there for the building sector that don't use the beauty shot on their website. 
not 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 on their homepage. Yep. It's it's there somewhere, but it's not it is not the front and center message on the homepage. Some of the best websites I've seen in architecture, they leave it out completely and on the homepage there's just a message, literally five words. And that's it, it goes right to the gut. Okay? They understand their market. Great. Do you have uh, do you know off the top of your head what those are or maybe you you can send them to me and we can put those in the show notes if you can think about it and maybe give us some examples of websites I'll that give you like. Some examples. Okay. Yeah. So you'll send those to me. Sure. <laughs> okay. Great, Sandra. Well, Sandra, thank you for joining me today. We've had an excellent conversation about this new media about marketing. Uh, I look forward to the feedback from the listeners. Leave your comments in the show notes. Uh, you know, come visit the page. You know, I know you're probably listening to this in your car. You're at the gym. What did you pick up out of Sandra's conversation with me? You know, she took time out of her schedule. Let's honor her by letting her know that we listened to this episode, you know, retweeting this on Twitter, reaching out to her through social media. Uh, Sandra, how can people reach you on social media, Twitter, for instance, and uh, your contact information? All my social media marketing links are on the website. So if you go to becker.ca, B-E-K-H-O-R dot C-A, find us on the social media site that you're on. And uh, and would love, love it if you'd come visit our blog. Excellent. Thanks, Sandra. I will blog about this. Okay. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Enoch. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.